Great. Um, there Thanks it goes. so much for joining us, Chaya. Happy to have you here. I'm looking yeah, forward. Thank to you for inviting me. I'm really excited. Um, let me make sure that screen sharing is working. Let's sure. See. Um, and if oh, you could okay. just introduce yourself to the group at some point, that would be awesome. Absolutely. Um, sorry, I because it's a work computer, it has so many restrictions on it. Mm. So it wants to make sure that I'm allowed to share my screen. Okay. Um, I'm going to have to log back on in order to share, and then hopefully we will be through all the technological glitches. Okay. Mm. All right, then. I will watch to admit her back in. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best recording yet. <laughs> so where is she from? SOU. Yeah, she's with the SOU in Ashland. All right. Okay. Um, hopefully back. So hi. Hi everyone, um, my name is Chaya Werner. I'm a new professor at Southern Oregon University. Um, I just moved here this past fall, um, so really brand new getting started. Um, I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about where I'm from and where I've been, but um, I, I'm an ecologist. Um, I'm a fire ecologist, I'm a plant ecologist, I'm a restoration ecologist, um, but I look at the world through the lens of thinking about plants and plant communities. Um, I think a little bit about herbivores and wildlife, but mostly in how they eat plants, and I think a little bit about pollinators, but again mostly in how they're affecting plants. Um, but you know, working in an area like this, um, similar to Sierra Nevada and some of the other places that I've worked as a fire ecologist and a plant person is that we live in a world that's integrated. Um, our homes and our plant communities are integrated, right, with our forests um, and with the way that wildfires spread, they don't really respect this, like this is forest and this is community, right? Um, and so very obviously then my research has kind of human implications and connections when we're thinking about um, how do we protect protect our communities? How do we build resilient forests? And what does that look like? Um, so it's really appreciative that Firebrand invited me to come, you know, get to meet some of you and speak with you all. Um, I do want to approach it from a really humble place. Like I was not here in 2020. Um, I've lived in places impacted by fire and by smoke, but not here. Um, and so, uh, yeah, many of my students are fire survivors um, as well at SOU. Um, so just putting that out there, you know, I'm coming in and I'm new, um, but I'll share with you a little bit of what I know and what I work on um, and then just open it up to questions. You know, um, Cass had originally pitched this as like a ask a fire survivor anything or sorry, ask a fire ecologist anything kind of meeting for you in the survivors meetup. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm open to, to any of those questions and would be happy to share. Yeah. Great. You. So, so I can still see all of you. Um, so that's me. And, and this is what I think about most is fire ecology and plant community regeneration after fire. So what comes back? What, what's going on, you know, for those seedlings um, for, or for those shrubs that are coming back? And one of the things that really motivates this research for me is thinking, you know, sometimes we go to a forest that's burned and there's a whole lot of regeneration. There's a lot of new growth. There's a lot of new life. Um, and sometimes we go to these forests and we see these kind of devastating loose say, photos that, you know, the media really loves, like the just the trauma and the cliche of it, um, but where there really isn't a lot coming back. And so a lot of my work is trying to understand why do we sometimes see one and sometimes see the other and how can we move more towards that regenerative fire um, and positive post-fire regeneration and you know what can we do to impact that process um, I've had the incredible opportunity to work and live in a lot of places around the world um, I kind of started out in um, California that's where I'm from originally um, I did work on the east coast and got my undergrad there um, I spent some time living in India and teaching there as well um, I came back to the West Coast. I got my graduate degree at UC Davis, um, where I studied in the Sierra Nevada 
um, as well as in shrublands in like Lake and uh, Yolo and Napa counties um, there. So kind of the the poorer side of wine country, the area that hasn't been taken over by vineyards yet. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I've, I've done a little bit of work in tropical rainforests. Um, did a postdoc after my PhD in Germany and in Finland, looking at tundra communities, um, which mostly don't burn, so they won't be in this talk, but that was a cool experience as well. I spent a couple of years working there. Um, and then I'm now back here. Um, oh, sorry, I lived for a while, did less research work, but lived for a while in um, Western Washington and Port Angeles. Um, I spent multiple years there. It's where my family is. Um, and then, yeah, I'm now here in Southern Oregon. Um, I do work in grassland communities and restoration, uh, in forest restoration and firework. Um, so I've been working with uh, the Rogue Forest Partners, which is a collaborative group that involves a nature conservancy in Lomakatsi and the Forest Service and BLM and SOU and OSU researchers um, thinking about forest restoration for fire resilience. Um, as well as I'm doing some research involved with the Klamath Dam removal and the river restoration project there. Um, and then very recently I've been working with the Rogue Pollinator Group, Rogue Valley Pollinator Group, um, and specifically with their From Fire to Flower Garden. So I don't know, <laughs> have I talked to all of you about that? Have you been involved with that? Not yet. She's scheduled for a future meetup, but she hasn't. Okay, well, I'll pitch it. I think it's really awesome. So we're working with them on their eighth garden, but it's specifically for people who lost their home, homes in the Alameda fire, um, who are rebuilding or have rebuilt their homes and for converting those kind of burned yards into native pollinator friendly gardens. Um, and so one of the classes I teach is actually working with them. Um, we're helping them design this garden for the homeowners. Um, and we're going to be implementing it then in March. So that's that's actually part of the class I just got back from, um, and I'm really excited about that too. So I'll put that pitch out from them, and and um, hopefully we'll get to hear more from them. Um, so that's that's kind of what I've gotten involved with here, um, and where I'm hoping to go in terms of my research. Um, so as I mentioned. Um, a lot of my research is in Sierra Nevada mixed conifer forest, which is a ways from here, but actually a really similar system. Um, and one of the things I think about a lot is just how much variation there is every year. Um, and in the eco region we're in, that is particularly so compared to almost anywhere in the world. So this is a series of three pictures of the Sierra Nevada snowpack um, in March. So kind of same date each year. Um, 2015 was at the end of a long winter drought comparing to 2017, which was like a really extreme late spring snowpack year. Um, I've seen recent photos of what the snowpack looks like now after all of the flooding and everything that California got. And it's it's even more um, impressive than that. Um, but just thinking about, you know, from the scale of a plant, um, if, if you're in one of these sites in 2015 versus 2017, and you're a little tiny seedling, um, what year it is makes a lot of difference. And these kind of patterns in weather that we know about um, really impact the plant community and the regeneration that we see. Um, so I, I studied this. Um, I did it in a couple ways. The first was this um, large scale observational study. So we went to 513 plots uh, with multiple fire crews um, in 14 over 14 different fires that had burned in different years. And just ask the question, if a fire was followed by drought, how did that reflect, affect conifer seedling regeneration? Um, and so we looked at this kind of on this big scale study and we saw the impacts of post-fire drought um, and that it's actually kind of idiosyncratic among species. So certain species get affected by drought more than others. Um, and what seemed to matter from a seedling perspective was not so much the duration of the drought, but just how bad did it get? What was that extreme drought point? Um, so that was kind of the, the big picture study. And then I took this and I wanted to zoom in and do an experiment. So field ecologists, we like messing with things. Um, 
it's where we also get to pretend that we're engineers for a little bit. So this was, you know, PhD me out there with a whole lot of PVC, trunkfuls of PVC I would bring up to the National Forest and chicken wire um, and like plastic greenhouse sheeting. And I made these little shelters so that, you know, there would be less snow on the ground and we could look at what happens if you have more snowpack, what happens if you have less snowpack. Um, so this is a site in the King Fire, which burned in 2014. Um, and it was an area where there was a whole lot of shrub regeneration. So these are a lot of manzanita species, um, ceanothus species, so things like buckbrush and whitethorn, um, all kind of popping up. Are those morels? Those are not morels. Okay. Those are stumps. Yes. I many times ran into mushroom hunters who were like, have you seen the morels? And I was like, no, I've just been staring at this one little patch of ground, but I'm sure they're around. Um, I'm sure it was a great spot for morels, but no, no, those are not. Um, yeah, so this is my site. And as I said, we built these shelters. We dug, um, mostly I dug ditches basically so that the melting snow would then move away from the plots and not go back into the plots um, to kind of create this drought effect. Um, so there they are. That's what they look like on the landscape. Um, I always like to shout out to my field crews. I have a lot of undergrads and other grad students working with me um, and they do hard work and fantastic work. So I really appreciate their help. Um, and then within these plots, we planted seeds. So I planted seeds of ponderosa pine, which is the yellow pine, uh, which you find up here, as well as white fir, uh, which doesn't come up here, but is similar to our other firs. Um, and as adults, ponderosa pine is known to be more drought tolerant and um, white fir is known to be more shade tolerant. But it was like, okay, but how does that play out when they're little tiny seedlings, you know, do the same things hold? Um, so then we go out and measure each little seedling with its little toothpick one at a time. Um, and the cool thing about these seedlings is they're only this big above ground and they have these incredible root structures. So even at the first year, you know, they're going down a foot, a foot and a half um, to get to the water. And so as I said, I ran this experiment in a couple of years. And so this first year we had kind of this average snowpack year. Um, and so what we found was for the white fur, if you reduce the snowpack or increase the snowpack, it didn't really care. Um, this was, you know, how many seedlings basically we had on the landscape out of the number of seeds that we planted. Um, for the ponderosa pine, if you reduce that snowpack, it actually hit it harder, which was interesting because that was the one that we thought was drought tolerant and it was more sensitive to this loss in water. Mm. And then my second year, we had this crazy year with this extreme amount of snowpack. Um, and so kind of not surprisingly, we saw the opposite pattern, which was reducing the snowpack actually kind of brought these seedlings back to what their more normal range of moisture was. Um, and so they did better in these reduced snowpack treatments. Um, so like I said, this site had a whole lot of shrubs on it. Um, and so one of our questions was, what's the role that these shrubs are playing in the recruitment of these conifer seedlings? Um, so we had plots where we either left all the shrubs regenerating um, or where we cut them all down and applied herbicide. Um, so those, yeah, those are all stumps sitting there um, to look at what the consequences on these seedlings was. Um, and there's a, there's a couple of things about this. And the reason it's not really an obvious question is on one hand, you know, shrubs kind of compete for a lot of things. They provide a lot of shade, they take up space, um, they compete for water. And so maybe being near a shrub is much more stressful for a seedling. But on the other hand, in the summer, shrubs provide some shade. Um, and these are burn sites, right? So they're, they're black char on the ground. They get really, really hot in the Sierra summer. All that light's being absorbed, especially, again, right there at the soil. Um, these seedlings are sitting right there where it's hottest. And so maybe having that shade actually helps them, you know, stay alive and surviving and losing it would be a negative thing. So we're looking at what's the balance of those different factors. Um, and basically what we found is that, yes, it does matter. Um, so these are, again, for our seedlings. And if you keep in the, that control treatment where you don't mess with the snowpack at all, um, if the shrubs are present, seedling survival is much lower. And if the shrubs are not present, then your survival is a lot higher. So that's kind of that first hypothesis. Um, but if you take 
the snowpack away and you put them in this drought condition, then it actually kind of balances out. So they have negative effects, they have positive effects, and we end up equal. And so moving towards a, a droughtier world or when we have periods of drought, um, those shrubs are actually doing a role in facilitating this forest regeneration as well. Um, and the reason that this is important kind of on a landscape scale um, is that, you know, a lot of you have probably heard this, but when we have kind of open forests, we can have fire and it kind of stays this low, the surface fire and perpetuates those open forests. Um, when we get infill by a lot of these firs and cedars and high density, um, then we can get fires that transition to this more shrub dominated ecosystem where we don't really see the regeneration. Um, and so what's interesting about this work is that that transition can actually really then be dependent on weather as to whether we're actually getting our conifers back on the landscape or not. Um, and that's important on a, a human perspective as well, because these shrub dominated landscapes then tend to burn more often and they also can burn at high severity. So even though there's a lot less fuel on the landscape, um, shrubs are really flammable. And so you can have fires much more frequently that are also not, not very, uh, low intensity fires, they can still be very high intensity fires. Yeah, and so this can maybe lead to this transition um, where you end up with shrub dominated areas of the landscape instead of conifers. Um, so I'm about to switch systems on you. So first I'll say, does anybody have questions or thoughts about any of that before I change over? Okay, Sherry, Sherry, did you? I thought I saw you say something, but I didn't. Couldn't hear it. Yeah, are you speaking of a conifer tree? Yeah, conifer trees. Okay, that's a good term. Yeah, conifer would be like pines and firs and cedars, all of our evergreen trees, mostly. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So the things that, like, when we kind of think of forest, are the dominant most of the dominant species in that forest. <laughs> Because aren't we like growing a lot of shrubs and stuff after the fire? There's a lot of like weed growth and all kinds of different. Yeah. Is that bad? Um, I mean, I think it depends on where it is. So here, like, like I was saying, we can get places where we don't really get trees back and we get a lot of shrubs, but these shrubs in this system are actually all native species. Um, and they're really important for birds and they're really important for pollinators. And, you know, they provide a lot of fruits and seeds that a lot of animals eat. So they're not necessarily like bad species. They're not even non-local species, um, but they're different. Uh, um, and then, you know, in, in our area here, I think in a lot of cases, yeah, weeds have kind of come in where some of those burned areas happen. Uh, and that's why I'm excited about like some of these pollinator garden restoration projects. Um, I know the Freshwater Trust is doing a lot of work along Bear Creek to actually, you know, try to keep things in a, a native and lower fuel loading restoration work, um, keep out the Himalayan blackberry. That's one of the big, problem <laughs> problem children in terms of um, these riparian plant communities. It grows really fast, it grows really big, um, and it provides a lot of fuel in a fire. And so they're they're trying to take that out as much as possible too. So are you saying in terms of the fire for a person's home, is it better not to have shrubs? They're so flammable, would it be better not to have them? <laughs> Um, I think so. I think that's a great question. Um, I think it's important to think about the fact that you'll always have something. Um, and so like some of these shrubs are not species you would want to plant right up next to your house because they are really flammable, but in the forest or a ways away would probably be fine. Um, some of the fires in Colorado last year and this year that have been really detrimental and problematic, those are all grass fires. So if you lose the trees and you take out the shrubs, that's what you're gonna get is grasses. Um, and those can be just as much of an issue for fires that cross into homes and developments. Yeah, so I, I don't think there's a single like bad ecosystem in terms of fires. 
or a perfect one. Um, but I do think that thinking about like what's naturally there um, and some of the areas, some of the restoration projects that like Rogue Forest Partners and Loma Casi are working on are like, how can we keep trees but get them much more spaced out? So you might have clumps of shrubs, but it's not like the whole hillside is shrubs. And so that wouldn't carry fire in the same way. Will the will the fire uh, pollinator project part of the pollinator project? Is someone there available to come and assess a person's home and their yard? It's a great question. Um, I am happy to give you contact info for who to be in touch with about that. Um, I think they do. I think they they do like a walkthrough with the homeowner and there's a first kind of application. Is this a site that's set up to be successful? And then there's a second walkthrough, which is like, what are your goals? Tell us about the site. Um, and then they kind of come up with garden designs. And so it's an iterative process. Yeah. But first Erica, one is did you want to mention the um, assessment training program? Uh, to... Sure. Yeah. The City of Ashland does a training for volunteer home assessors. So they train people to, you know, walk a property with a homeowner and identify risk, well, well by risks that can be uh, mitigated and then ways to improve the fire safety of the property. Uh, and so that's, uh, we have a chance to send some people from Phoenix and town to that training this time around, which is exciting. So if anyone here is interested, that's happening starting in March. Cool. That's great. Thank yeah, you. and those assessments would give you different and complementary things, right? One is like the home risk and fire risk and the other one would be what native species might we wanna put on the ground. So they're, they're related and they're connected, but it would be awesome to get both. Definitely. Yeah. And I saw Zoya had her hand up. Do you have something, Zoya? Uh, um, I was, I was going to say, are these the pollinator gardens, the ones down the greenway? Um, I, stuff like that, you're talking about those pollinator gardens? I don't know where all of them are. Um, I know there's, there's three in Phoenix, at least. Um, and then the one that we went to today is at Bear Creek Mobile Home Park. Mm -hmm. And then there's three more down the trail. Yeah, I worked with um, uh, the Green Sweep program. We did the pollinary gardens. I weeded all around them and stuff like that at Blue Heron Park and down the trail. And I I would love to work with your guys' team, but I mean, I mean, I would like to work with your guys' team if there's any chance of, you know, that. I mean, I, I, I know about pollinaries, and I would love to learn more about it and stuff. And yeah, yeah I, I think they're they're an entirely, so it's not my team, um, as cool as I think they are. I think they're an entirely volunteer organization, um, and their office headquarters is actually right next door from Firebrand's headquarters, so um, oh, yeah, you can, you can always pop in and ask, um, but I can share their contact information as well. Awesome. All right. Um, so I'm going to, we're going to go on a, a location shift and we're going to talk about a community that's actually naturally dominated by shrubs now. Um, so a little bit of different ecosystem. Um, it's one that we actually do find in the Ashland area, but it's much less common in the Rogue Valley area. Um, but this is, these are our shrub communities. So the, the fancy ecological word for this is chaparral. Um, but it's just a community that's dominated by shrubs that doesn't usually have these big overstory trees. You know, there's not oaks, there's not pines. Um, that's this, that's what's naturally there. Um, and I was looking at this, um, this really cool site where there's actually two different types of soil that are all patchy next to each other. Um, and so the first type is a sandstone soil, which is much easier for plants to grow in. It's really fertile. It has more nutrients. Um, it holds water better, things like that. And then these other patches are serpentine soil, um, which we have locally in the Klamasiskis as well. But it's this weird, harsh soil. It's got a lot of like magnesium and toxins in it for some plants. Um, it's, it tends to be very rocky. It doesn't hold water very well. So from a plant perspective, it's really stressful. Um, 
But one of the benefits of being so stressful is that it ends up becoming a haven for native species. Um, so we have on this fertile soil, there'll be certain species that come in and just outcompete everything else. Whereas on this really harsh soil, we actually end up sometimes with higher diversity of species because they're these ones that can tolerate these weird, harsh conditions. Um, and these are communities that then tend to burn relatively often, um, kind of every like 20 to 50 years. Um, and when they burn, uh, they do come back and they're really beautiful um, in kind of an extreme way. Uh, so this is a picture where we have re-sprouting shrubs. Um, so they'll dive, they'll get burned above ground, but they'll survive below ground and then they'll come back and sprout. Um, as well as uh, this is uh, Yerba Santa, which has these big showy white flowers when it comes up all over the hillside. Um, and again, and especially on these serpentine soils, we get this crazy diversity of native species. So this is just, you know, a little one foot by one foot patch. Um, and I think it's got like 15 different species in it all coming back. Um, and there's also a real diversity of what these species are, the plants that come back. So we have bulbs that come up after fire, like iris and onions, wild onions. Um, there's a lot of different flowering species. Um, there's shrub species that re-sprout or come up from seed, but there's even vines. So this is like a native cucumber species called Mara that comes up. And you can just see the, the range of colors and types of flowers and life history strategies. So um, from, you know, like a human perspective, so these can be really beautiful landscapes, um, but also from this plant perspective, there's this opportunity when fire happens for all these things that would be overshaded by shrubs. They come up, they do their thing, they go crazy, they put out a lot of seeds, and then those seeds basically sit in the soil for 50 years waiting for the next fire. That's the game they play. Um, so it's this really long-term game. Um, I also, again, want to shout out to my field crew. So this is us out there taking data. Um, fields of shrubs are not the easiest thing to work in. So this is one of my advisors. She's um, in her late 60s and, you know, in shrubs over her head running out some of these plots. So um, this is life as an ecologist. This is what it looks like. And we're usually like come back, you know, smeared with dirt and soot and like with all of our clothing ripped to pieces from the shrubs. But um that's what that looks like. That's what goes into this work. Um, so we had this research project. Again, this is in um, Lake County, which is around Clear Lake, as well as Yolo County and Napa. Um, so just on the, the west side of Central Valley. Um, and there, there had been a fire that had burned there in 1999. My advisor um, had collected a whole bunch of data on plant communities after that fire. Um, and then there was another fire that burned in just the next door area in 2015. And the really interesting thing about this was that fire in 1999 had come at a time when all of the weather was sort of average. So this is here on the x-axis, we're just looking at different years. It says water year, but that's just how we, you know, break up the, the year. So instead of going January to January, we're going October to October. Um, so just the timeline of years. And then this is how much rainfall this site had received. So this 1999 fire was in sort of an average, lots of average precipitation. Um, this 2015 fire happened at the end of this really extreme drought in California, multi-year drought. And so we wanted to know how does the combination of these things stack? So we looked at what happens if fire is followed by drought. And so then the next question was, well, what happens if the drought comes first? You know, does it matter? Um, and so that's what we were doing was comparing these two fires and these two studies to see what's what's the impact of that drought that came before the fire. Um, and we had some hypotheses about this, you know, that these regenerating shrubs would not be able to come up as well because this below ground storage is one of the things that gets them through drought. So they store all these nutrients in their roots. It gets really droughty. Um, basically, they're, they're eating skimpy. And so they use all of that storage below ground. But that's the same storage that they need to regenerate after fire. So if they've been hammered by the drought, maybe they don't come back up as well. Um, and also that we would have a lot of exotic species, non-native species, um, especially grasses that would come in. And so that was a concern. And then we were thinking, well, this will probably happen on these fertile soils, these sandstone soils, but 
maybe it won't be so bad on these harsh soils. Like maybe everything's really harsh there already. And so drought doesn't matter because it's so stressful, it can't get any worse. Um, and this is more or less what we found. Um, so we started looking at these fertile sandstone soils. Um, and this is kind of a complicated graph, but we're just looking at how likely a shrub species was to survive. One of these ones that has the potential to store below ground and then sprout up after fire and come back. How likely were they to come back? Um, so down from, you know, none of the shrubs in the plot survived to all of the shrubs in the plot survived. Um, and in 1999, basically, almost all of their plots, everything survived, at least three quarters of the shrubs in the plot survived. Whereas in 2015, what we found was that in these plots that had really small shrubs, because there'd been a fire already about 15 years ago, um, we had really low survival. So maybe only about a quarter of the shrubs survived. But the ones that had bigger shrubs that were kind of beyond a certain diameter, they were more established, they actually came back really well. So not everything got hammered, just the small things got hammered. Um, and then the other thing we found that fit with our expectation was that on these harsh serpentine soils, actually they didn't care. Big, small, recently burned, um, drought stress, whatever, they came back anyway. Um, so these are kind of our, our super resilient shrubs. This is a, a scrubby oak species, um, Quercus serrata. Uh, so it's not a big oak tree, it just stays down like that. It's called leather oak because it's got these really, really tough leaves. Um, and so, yeah, basically it can handle anything. It can handle all of these things. Um, then we were also looking at these exotic species. So these grasses that come in, they kind of provide fine fuels. Um, they can carry fire really well too. Um, and so basically what we saw here again, comparing, you know, through time. So one year after the fire, two years after the fire, three years after the fire, um, how many of these exotic species were there? And what we found was, you know, 1999, an average of about seven per plot. Um, 2015, that had gone up on these sandstone soils, so 10 to 12. Um, serpentine soils, the first year after the fire, actually hadn't really changed at all, about three per plot. Second year after the fire, that's that really wet year that I showed you back last time in the pictures with all the snow. Um, so a lot of water came in and some of those exotic species started showing up. But then by the next year, the water was gone and they were gone again. So again, these harsh soils, those are the ones that are hanging on. They're doing great, even with all these stressors. Um, and then the last thing that we looked at was these like beautiful, abundant native species, right? All the wildflowers, all this, this crazy native richness. Um, and so that basically, that's all resilient. It tracks. So on the sandstone soils, they drop through time because the shrubs come back so fast, they get outshaded. So you get this big bunch of diversity, 25 species per plot, and then they drop away pretty quickly. Um, and then on our serpentine soils, they're doing great. They're about the same as we saw in 1999. And same thing that really wet year, we jumped up to about 25 species per plot. So this really diverse system um, and this richness, this native richness seems to be pretty resilient, even as I said, to this extreme multi-year drought and then fire. Um, so that's kind of my drought piece. And then the last thing I think about a lot with fire is spatial patterns, um, which is kind of complicated and hard to talk about. Um, but basically just thinking about how are things clumped, you know, think about like a, a plantation monoculture and everything's really, really even, um, you know, flat and the same versus something where there's a clump of trees here and a clump of trees there and a clump of trees over there and gaps in between. Um, so that's kind of the spatial patterning that I think about. Um, and so I do this in different ways. One of these was a, this is a remote sensing study. So we're actually using satellite images to look at this. Um, and so basically it's saying, if you have a, a key area and you wanna know again, how, how much did it burn? How many of those trees are left alive? And you can compare, well, what if it's surrounded by that really even landscape versus if it's surrounded by something that's totally patchy? Um, and then we did this and we, because we did this remote sensing project, we're able to look at over a thousand fires when we do this, because we don't have to go to each one on the ground. Um, so we're using this satellite data to do this. Um, and what we find is that having this really patchy neighborhood means that you're more likely to have 
trees survive at your particular location. And so having this diversity, not even diversity of species, but just diversity of structure really adds to forest resilience. Uh, so that's something that we think about kind of on this landscape restoration scale. Um, and so the last, the last piece that I think about, and I told you we're going to jump around a little bit. So this is our like total jump. We're going to Africa. Um, we're looking at African savanna, but that same question, which is about fire and patchiness. Um, and so this is a project where they allow different herbivore species into these plots or out of them. So there's cattle, um, there's small herbivores like antelope and zebra, and then there's these mega herbivores, so elephants and giraffes, things like that. Um, and there's these big old electrified fences to either keep the elephants out or allow them into plots. Um, and this is a project where we're doing prescribed burns. So we had a 30 person team um, burning certain sections of these plots. Um, and I'm going to give away the answer before I tell it to you, but basically, if you don't have any herbivores and you've excluded them all, this is what your fire looks like. Everything's burning, black and continuous, nice continuous fuel layer, it's all there, it burns. And when you have herbivores, you can create this patchiness with all of these gaps in between where there's not a lot of fuel, um, and we get this really patchy burn on the landscape, which is a much more resilient process. Um, so this is this, this is just a map of what that looks like. So we've got through, we've got these six treatments of different numbers of herbivores allowed into the plots or not, um, and then three of those replicated, and we burn these little plots inside of those. Um, and then we just looked at well, how much of the plot burned? You know, we went around, we lit it all up. What proportion of that area was burned, and what? proportion was unburned from no herbivores at all, all the way up to all of the herbivores present here on the right. Um, and it turns out if you burn the plot once, um, black is what percent burns, a little bit more burns when you have no herbivores present, and somewhat less burns when you have a lot of herbivores. It's not super exciting. If you burn the plot twice, so we did this five years apart, burned it in 2013, burned it again in 2015, you get a really big difference. And so that interaction between herbivores and fire is really what drives the pattern. So these ones, you burn it a little bit, the herbivores say, this is great. They love burned areas. There's so much to eat there. So they all show up and come in and they really mess with that area. And then you burn it again and there's like almost nothing to burn. Um, Whereas the plots with no herbivores, you burn it once, you clear out that fuel layer, it all grows back at the exact same time, even continuous, and then everything burns. And that's where you get that really complete burn. So you get this really strong pattern um, with that repeat burn. So that's a lot of what I think about too, is like, how do these feedback loops play out? You know, like we can find a pattern after one fire, what does that mean for the next fire? Um, yeah, and so then we're thinking about this too in terms of well, how does that affect, you know, again, my little seedling trees, they're growing way down in the grass in savanna. And so having those patches means that those trees can actually still survive after fire, things like that. Um, yeah, so that's kind of all of my pieces. As I said, it's a little all over the place, but mostly just opening it up for Q&A. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to thank all of my funders and locations and people that I work with, but um, looking forward to chatting with you all some more. Thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. I don't know how many questions you left. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Well, I was wondering how you got into this work, like what got you interested in it and involved in it? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I, it's just what I'm excited about, I think. Um, it seems like, I mean, I, I really do think that going into landscapes that are burned and then coming back is like one of the most weirdly beautiful places in the world. Um, but I also do, you know, know that sometimes that's not what's happening. And so I think that was the thing that really I got caught on was like, can we understand when regeneration is happening naturally well on its own and when it's not, and it might need some help or we might need to fix something that we've messed up. Um, 
it was funny because I was doing my PhD and I would tell people, you know, I'm studying drought and fire. And they'd be like, oh, you're really lucky because there's a lot of that going on. And I was like, well, no, I think I picked it because it's a relevant topic. And I think it's important to right now. Um, but I also think it's just really interesting and the plants are really interesting. And so I don't know, that doesn't answer how I got into it, but that's like why I think I gravitated towards those research, that research and those researchers and kind of set myself on that path. It's a good answer. So when you went Other to problems? Africa, how long did you spend in Africa? Um, I was there for only like five or six weeks. So this is a project that my advisor has been working on for over 30 years. Wow. Um, yeah. And it wasn't a main part of my PhD, but then they were doing these prescribed fires. So I got invited along to help with just the fire piece of it, um, which was really cool. That is really cool. Do we have herbivores in Medford? <laughs> we have deer. Yeah. <laughs> deer eat plants and they're definitely herbivores. Um, I also, I don't know about you all, but I have skunks in my backyard and they dig up all my tree roots. Uh, so those are, yeah, they're not, they're trying to eat the grubs, but they're definitely impacting the plants in my garden. Um, but deer are the big ones for us, for sure. Yep. This is a reminder. Take the trash out. Oh. Oh. I love it. <laughs> what <laughs> reminder is that? <laughs> I love it. Who was that? Um, Michael, you Michael, I see your hand raised. Yeah. I, I really appreciate the... Uh, the logic, the brilliance of the deductions, you know, just the whole scientific uh, approach that you took to it uh, uh, in coming up with your uh, hypothesis beforehand. Let's see if it works out. And, you know, just uh, all that, that excitement. It's really good. Um, <clears throat> and it struck me because in, in the uh, we saw the premiere of um, uh, the movie. What was the name of the movie? elemental yeah yeah uh, that had the um native american perspective on recovery uh as well and so the tie-ins to the work you did is really um um cool because it corroborates <laughs> uh so much and and that you're able to take the advantage of the snow uh to uh do both dry and wet um uh, and test it that was really cool um so i just really i appreciated the uh, work you're doing i kind of wanted to to uh, to say that and i guess um uh the question might be where does it go from here um in terms of applications things we need to start doing what are the i guess implications of yeah, your work that's that's a great big picture question. Um, I think one of the implications is something you actually referenced, which is um, empowering people who have experienced putting fire on the landscape. In a lot of cases, that's cultural burning and cultural knowledge that comes from the tribes, uh, the Karuk and the Klamath and the Yurok tribes um, are all doing really amazing work trying to get fire back on the landscape. Um, you know, there's also a lot of work being done by by the Forest Service and mm -hmm. Kofsky and Nature Conservancy um, to do that in our areas where there isn't currently as much of a tribal presence. Um, and, and in a lot of cases, that's like clearing and thinning and then burning um, and the combinations of that. Um, and so that's, I mean, that's kind of what I see as like restoration going forward. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the the big picture challenges with this, and I think you all will appreciate this too, is like um, prescribed fire is far less risky than wildfire to to people, um, to houses in terms of smoke, like the amount of smoke that comes off of a prescribed burn versus a wildfire. Um, but the challenge with prescribed fire is that somebody's responsible for it. So if one does get out of hand, if there is an issue, um, someone's liable. Whereas if there's a wildfire, it could be way, way worse. Um, but there's nobody to blame. 
And so that's like on like a policy and logistics side. And like I said, I don't work with people other than teaching. I don't do this, but um, that's one of the biggest challenges is saying like, how do we make it so that uh, we have, you know, insurance and protections for people doing prescribed fire because nothing's totally without risk mm -hmm. and recognize that for us as the people living in that community, a prescribed fire is going to be better 99 times out of a hundred than just waiting for the wildfire to happen. Um, and, and facilitate that in terms of, um, like our legal and political structure so that that liability issue isn't there. Um, so oh, I think huh. that's, yeah, that's one of my like, so what, um, I think the other one too, is just really thinking about like native, native species and whether that's like planting in our own garden or mm -hmm. being able to go out on a hike and appreciate what's there. Um, finding areas that have, have burned in a wildfire even, um, and going out and looking for some of those plants is a really great way to appreciate that diversity and start thinking about it too. Um, so how many degrees would you say um, we're talking about in terms of change of direction and thought about fire? You know, I think it <laughs> depends on who, you know, I, I get to meet with my students and they're young and they're energetic and you tell them this stuff and they're like, yeah, we're good. Prescribe fire. Let's do it. Like, where's the drip torch? Let's get started. <laughs> um, you know, I, taught, I taught a whole fire ecology class last term. And one of the feedback things I got was like, why didn't we get to light anything on fire? I was like, okay, well, <laughs> that's a whole nother program. Um, but, I can see how that would appeal to the kids. Right. But like, <laughs> you know, the insurance companies or the lawyers or the people, you know, the forest service chief who's sitting there with all that liability on his head right now. Right. Um, those are slower processes, yeah. but I think, I think we're, we're getting there. Um, you know, I think even around here, like I've seen a lot of hillsides with smoke coming off of them awesome. this winter. And to me, that's a really good sign and a really healthy sign. Um, but even just sharing that with your friends and your neighbors, like, oh, look good. It's burning in December. That's what right. we want, right? right. Somebody lit that up and that's great. That's a yeah. good sign. Yeah. Um, kind of helps reinforce that. So it doesn't, it's not like, oh my gosh, it's scary. You know, because mm -hmm. for so many of us, there is that like what's on fire and it's scary. And so just remembering like winter smoke is good smoke yeah. um, and trying to keep that in mind. Good. Thank you very much. Erica? Yeah, thanks, Cass. Um, super fascinating work. Thanks for being here to share it. Um, to your points about prescribed fire, I work in prescribed fire in not in my day job, um, but as like a side hustle, I guess you would say currently. Um, you burn at night. Aha, <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. good one. Um, yeah, so I recently was researching and it's like 1% of prescribed burns escape or less than 1%, right? Really small percentage. So it's just another way to think about risk. I also tend to think there are there are people who are responsible for uh, sort of the magnitude of the wildfires that we have and the severity of the wildfires that we have, but it's not easily traced back to one individual the way that prescribed yeah. fires can be. So that's the challenge Absolutely. like you're saying um yeah so stuff yeah I, I also have observed that um prescribed fire smoke is just qualitatively quite different from wildfire smoke absolutely so whether it's in the winter or other times of the year i mean you can be burning in the fall the spring even the early summer and have good effects that smoke tends to be less toxic, dissipate much faster. It just looks less um, imposing and scary. Um, so I just tend to put that out there when I talk about, I like to hear you use the term good smoke though. Mm -hmm. I use that one a lot. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think too, with the stat you shared, it's you know less than 1% of prescribed burns escape. and kind of the funny thing too is that um slightly more but still really low only about two percent of wildfire ignitions become fires that we notice on the landscape 
um, because of because of our fire suppression work. So it's also something that you know we think about and we talk about too is like it's not that we're not good at suppressing wildfires. We're actually really, really good at it. But then you think about like, what are those 2% that escape? And they're the ones on really dry days or really windy days or in really extreme fuel locations. And they're the ones that are more likely to cause problems. And so even comparing, you know, you're comparing 2% to 1%, but also the 1% of prescribed burns that escape are still not in the worst part of the summer or something like that, right? Um, well, and where the fire's been being suppressed so long that there's a lot of fuel. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and another difference um, is that you can really choose when and where you burn and have all the resources right there. And so the yeah. chances, right, that's why you have that less than 1% statistic. The chances of those escapes is really slim. Mm -hmm. so you have a lot of control. You've set yourself up to have a lot of control over the, the situation. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if this is who you work with, but I do know um, the Rogue Valley has a prescribed burn association um, and folks, you can just sign up to be on their email list and they'll tell you like we're doing a burn and you actually don't have to have any training to come join them. Um, so if you want to go out and participate <laughs> in a burn and see what's happening, they've got everybody with training and all the training and safety and trucks and everything on the landscape that they need to do it. Um, and you can actually go join if that's something that you're interested in. So I don't know if that's who you're working with, if you're working with another group, but. Um, yeah, a little bit. I mean, it's a small world in prescribed fire, but um, I've worked with all the folks in the Klamath. That's kind of where I came from. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then I recently co-founded a couple of nonprofits that are just focused on prescribed fire. Um, so that's, that's my current <laughs> involvement, but um, yeah, I've, I've been lucky to be around a lot of prescribed fire and contrast that with experiences with wildfire. And it's just a night and day type of experience. Um, so I'm going to put that prescribed burn association link in the chat if anyone wants to check it out. I just pulled it up. Yep. Twice. You get it yep. twice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll also pull up the pollinator group that I talked about in there from Fire to Flowers Gardens. Okay, so when the Q&A ends, I will stop recording before we go back to check-ins. So let me just cue me into when that is. <laughs> Do other people have questions for Taya? I just have a quick question. Okay, so I live in a, a mobile home park where we had like Oh my gosh, I would say probably 150 year old trees, cedar, um, sequoias, I would say probably 20 at least for lots. So doesn't that affect like the oxygen in our valley or in that area? Because all those trees were there. I know it affects the birds and all that stuff, but so that would be my question. All those, the loss of all those trees, does it affect our oxygen? Yeah, uh, um, that's a great question. I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I do know, and I think this is why you're asking and you're absolutely right, that like some of those big trees are really, really important for the amount of oxygen they produce and the um, even like basically filtration work that they do on the air. Um, I think but it's in the uptake of, of like, CO2 that's really the big difference. Yeah, CO2 uptake, um, but even just, you know, filtering out pollutants as well. Um, but yeah, in terms of like how, how a countable number of trees affect the valley, um, I don't know, but I, I would believe that it could. Oh, one more thing I wanted to mention, maybe you all know about this, but it's like one of the things I try to tell everybody anytime I talk about fire is um, for smoke effects. 
um, there's a really easy way to make a low cost air purifier for your house. Um, and this is basically going to Home Depot and you get just the filters that you would fit into a filter. So like the HEPA filter comes in a cardboard thing um, and you tape it on a box fan and you cover all the edges up with cardboard and you tape it shut with tape. Um, but that's like a $15 air purifier and it does almost as well as the big fancy ones that they sell to hospitals. Wow. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. And um, so I can also send you that, you know, people have come up with different designs for them, but that's the basic concept is just tape it up with duct tape really tight so that the air is only coming in one direction. Um, and that does, it does a really big difference and it can make a big impact in a room. So um, mm -hmm. as we're dealing with smoke for all the years to come in the summer, um, that's, yeah, that's like the, probably the best thing I can tell you about fire. Cool. I just got the tail end of the duct tape part. What is the other constituent of that? So you buy like at Home Depot or something, you buy just an air filter. So it's like a, it's a cardboard thing. It's like an insert that you would put into an HVAC system or into something like that. Get one that's HEPA rated and you tape it to the front of a box fan. And then the duct tape is to keep it so that the air is not coming in both directions. It's only going through the box fan in the one direction and through that filter. Um, and yeah, the people have done studies on them and they do amazingly good job of cleaning your air for very little money. That's great. Thank you. I... Should I stop recording now? Last call for questions. All right, sounds like a good time to